Hello everyone, um, thank you very much for coming today. Um, we're going to wait a couple of minutes just for any last few people that joined us because we had a lot of people sign up. Um, but don't worry, we will be starting um, in just a few minutes. Okay, so just seen a few more people join in, just to let you know, we are um, starting in a few minutes, we're just waiting for any last minute people that are joining us. I haven't got a spotlight, it's the sun on my face, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so for a couple of minutes in, I think we can probably um, make a start and uh, we've got a few minutes of housekeeping and everything recording. A little bit of microphone uh, noise going on there, sorry about that guys. Um, yeah, so we're a little bit of um, housekeeping for the first few minutes, so anyone that joins us is going to be okay, hopefully. Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining us today on our panel discussion. Um, we're looking today at how libraries and information um, professionals are coping during the pandemic. Um, so it's going to be hopefully be a really interesting um, conversation. We've got a couple of seeded questions, but also we're going to we really love um, your questions too. So there's a few ways of doing that. You can pop. Um, questions in the question panel down the bottom or in the chat also have a tablet which you can um share with um so you can again see that on the chat our colleague catherine's pop that link there um so i've just seen there's someone's hands gone up so yeah you can um we won't be stopping in the middle of it to take um individual questions but stephen who is um, moderating oh stephen i think there's a little bit of feedback on your microphone now i'm going to just mute you Okay, um, so yes, yeah, uh, Stephen, who's moderating the panel today, will be able to take this question at the end. Okay, so without further ado, um, if you would like to watch um, us speaking, we have shared our webcams, and um, so you can do that by looking on the webcam um, feature on the drop down um, at the side of the page. It might already be popping up on your screen depending on how you're blogging. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I'll hand over to Stephen Phillips, who is chairing our panel today. And I'll mute him. OK, thank you very much indeed, Amy. Uh, let me know if the sound is a problem as we go through. Um, so uh, as Amy said, a very, very warm welcome to this um, session. Uh, I'm going to moderate the conversation today. and But before we kind of get into that, um, we've just got a couple of uh, formalities to go through and a couple of things to let you know about that are coming up and uh, have been happening recently in, in, in SLA. Um, so in terms of some, some announcements, we've um, you may have seen some communication recently that now there's uh, three extra months for members in terms of the, the, the membership ex terms being extended by three months in order to help support uh, those, those members that have been adversely affected by the, by the current pandemic. 
Um, so a little bit of extra goodwill being extended to, to the membership there. And in addition to that, now all of the communities, uh, which are previously known as the kind of the chapters and the caucuses uh, and the like, have now been opened up at no extra cost, uh, whereas previously they were something like $20 to join up. So if you uh, visit the SLA uh, website, the main SLA website, and go through to Connect, then you'll be able to uh, select any additional um, areas of interest or communities of, of interest that uh, uh, might, might, be, uh, might be relevant to you uh, in order to augment your membership. And then lastly, uh, a really good news story, uh, but John Cole, who many of you I'm sure will know, um, who was really one of, the, uh, one of the driving forces behind our conference last year, was actually made um, a fellow. Uh, John was past president of SLA uh, Europe in 2016, and in fact, John and I were at university together studying. Uh, so he and I go back a very, very long way. Uh, and I'd like to just pass, personally pass my congratulations to, to him here now. I'm not sure if he's joined us uh, uh, for this session. Uh, and I'm sure if you know him, you could reach out and, uh, and wish him all the best. Um, Right, so with those formalities over, what we're going to do is that we've got some uh, questions for our, our panel this morning. We've put together a very, very uh, strong panel to, to speak to everybody, um, made up primarily of our, of our kind of officers and officers elect. So Seema Ramsad is a senior business researcher and service manager at the Business and IP Centre of the British Library in London. She's a very, very high profile member of SLA Europe, uh, and in fact, so high profile that she's president this year. Uh, and doing a, doing a grand job. So she's, uh, she has joined us uh, as uh, the other uh, participants from home uh, and, and to help us out on, on today's uh, conversation. Uh, Amy Stubbing is the library manager at University of East London. Um, she's had a wealth of experience in the academic sector. And Amy is actually gonna be our president next year. So she's pres-elect for this year and, and look, is looking forward, I'm sure, to stepping up into the president's role in 2021. And then finally, uh, Simon, Simon Burton. Uh, he's the managing director and co-founder of CB Resourcing. He's the immediate past president uh, last year and again did a fabulous job of, of bringing SLA Europe on and you know, sponsoring the conference and, and really putting us, uh, putting us on the map there. So um, you know, Simon's uh, got a lot of experience dealing with a broad cross-section of clients in the information industry and, and can come with a, a lot of um, perspectives really on, on the current situation. So, um, in, in kicking off, um, I'm going to ask a few questions. As Amy's already said, you know, there is opportunity to throw questions out there or any thoughts that occur to you as the conversation un unfolds. And we'd really welcome uh, any comments, any uh, questions that you, you'd like to, to put to the, to the panelists. So, please use the chat or the Padlet app to do that. Okay, so I, I guess, you know, we're all getting used to the new normal. Um, it's, you know, we're all kind of uh, figuring out how to work and operate through lockdown. Uh, we're all relying massively on the technology these days. Um, but it seems to me like there's been a lot of challenges that have been facing, you know, a broad cross section of our community in terms of retaining their effectiveness and really making sure that we're able to continue to make a difference to our respective organizations. And I really just wanted to, to start the conversation by asking the panel really about what the, that single biggest challenge has been. So, have, you know, uh, maybe I can start with you, Seema, if you can kind of reflect on the last few weeks and, and, and what's really been, uh, been the biggest hurdles you've had to overcome in your role. Have we lost Seema? I think she's just unmuting herself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Obviously, one of the big challenges is finding the un. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I hope we meet um, everyone in a in good health and um, in your homes and um, everyone's. You know, it's been a few weeks now and everything's settling in. Um, but for me, it's really been kicking into the business continuity in, in a very sort of challenging time, probably the most challenging, um, challenging time I've ever had um, um, in terms personally, but also in the business context. Um, but the main priority really is the health and safety of staff who I work with and also our customers. We're a very public facing organization. So that was one of the key things in terms of like, you know, um, the reference room, really people coming into the library. So, so, so high level decisions were made um, and the build up to the lockdown. And also there were concerns for staff at the time. 
Um, so then you go into automatic in terms of business continuity. So yes, it was business as usual, but a lot of crisis management initially. And I don't know if you remember those five weeks ago when everyone was actually struggling to put things in place. So change management, um, change management, adjustments to the services, but it was also an opportunity to switch to like the digital transformation that had been sizzling in the background for a long time. Um, also being part of SLA and, and also having worked for other organizations, I think I had some experience of actually working in virtual teams and being digital, but um, this actually meant a long, prolonged time of actually working from home. So that was the main challenge of all the business continuity. Um, the, the lot of, with regards to the changes, obviously we have to switch from a lot of face-to-face -face, um, that happens in the, the British Library, things, people coming into the reference desk, our workshops, our one-to-one -one, um, advice sessions, they all became digital. So we had to use the modern technology to carry on those services. But what it made me realize in the few weeks that have gone by is that something I've always believed in, that we still need the physical space. So we're having to adapt, but also bearing in mind there are users who don't have access to the physical spaces. So a, a, a lot of this actually had a lot of impact on teams, you know, I know how are people coping with change, the whole change management thing, you know, some people respond positively, some people are, are, are faster than others, some are, uh, need help. So some of the staff and customers were probably ready, some weren't. Some of them, some of the staff probably had new experiences of working from home and some of us have, haven't. Um, funny enough, I always remember when uh, the London bombings of 7, 7th of July 2005, because I was at home because my son had chicken pox and um, I was used to working from home, but the whole chaos of actually going through crisis and thinking about your colleagues and having to continue with services and stuff like that. That's something I think helped me for, for this situation. I, even in the office, I would sort of like be prepared of being able to carry on home to, from that experience and um, um, to this current day. But obviously not everything can be carried out because of the face-to-face the -face that goes on. Um, so, so, the, so technology was an enabler, but also a barrier for those people who are physically coming into the library. Um, we are very much very public facing, so we have to deal with some of the things that um, the hardware and the software that you know, the staff might need, but also thinking of our customers. So this has become the age of sort of like video conferencing. So for example, we're using GoToWebinar now. So those are things that we, we use at the British Library, but also things like Zoom. I've never heard of Zoom before the, lock, the lockdown. Um, uh, I used Microsoft Teams this week for, for, for a workshop that I attended, Skype for one-to-one -one advice clinics and um, apps. Um, some of the things like WhatsApp is actually switching our teams to virtual, but also the different levels of, uh, of software and hardware. WhatsApp has actually been a really good communication tool that we've used, um, especially for project space as well in the past. Um, so having to use it now for everyday communication is one thing, because not everybody have access to emails or laptops or things like that. And, um, and also being able to continue to offer the services to the business community. We've continued a really good program to the business community in this very hard time um, that, um, that's affected everyone. So uh, hoping to be positive and also give those opportunities to people who are having difficult times being the business and IP Centre has been really good and sort of made me grounded in this time because it kind of tells you that you've got to refocus your work. So just, I just want to, send, to end by saying that we had two success stories that we've had a bridal designer who can't make bridal wear at this time, people postponing their weddings, but she's had to repurpose her work to, to actually create PPP um, for helping for NHS staff. So having to tweak things, project work and changing things with our stakeholders and partners. That's me. Okay, thanks very much, Sumi. You covered a lot there. Um, rather than dwell too much on that, maybe we can move on to Amy, and uh, you can give us your reflections really on on you know what what's your biggest biggest challenge in the last uh, last month or so. Yeah, I think there's a lot of crossover, and I'm sure that's what we'll find through this panel is that like all of the information services and library services, we're all kind of facing that same thing of like we have this service that we just now suddenly have to rethink entirely the way that we offer it. I mean, two of the things that 
really um, like sticks out in my mind when we ask what the biggest challenge is, is um, number one, kind of obvious, maybe from an academic library point of view in particular, is engaging with users, but um, specifically without the time to um, like have supported the users in moving to a completely new way of, of working with us and learning. So, I mean, we have got a lot of um, really digitally, digitally savvy um, users but also we've got a lot of people that um like we're throwing new things at them that maybe they've never um, actually had the time to engage with or the reason to engage with before i mean we have all these uh, tools like teams and the various microsoft suites and everything but actually if you're not forced into it what i'm finding um, and maybe what I'm I was quite surprised about is that people don't necessarily um they've never actually necessarily used that um so that's in itself in a challenge i think actually that tool of just being able to see people particularly as a frontline librarian and say look can i show you how to access this team site or can i can i walk you through how to find some more online resources um has been really difficult and so we've got some really good um tools that we're using which hopefully i'll talk about a bit later on um but it's just getting that engagement in the first place and then i mean the second really big challenge that i think we're facing that I, again i'm sure everyone is is helping make sure that staff are actually comfortable and set up correctly so that they're, and that they're supported in all of this it's just it's really hard i think to suddenly go from one way of working um to a completely opposite when you especially when you think of them um, say frontline staff where so much of their job is that face-to-face -face interaction and um, it's physically dealing with the books it's um the space itself to suddenly then go what what is our role in an online um environment how do we relearn all of this how do we reshape it also let's get all your digital skills up also you might not have a laptop let's find a way to do that so there's loads of different layers to actually making sure people's mental health is okay as well as just getting the service out there for the, the students great okay thank you uh, and lastly simon last but not least um from your perspective challenges um challenges um well, you, 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 you'll you be able to see I haven't been in for a haircut for a little while, um, but also, um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously there's being a, a relatively small business, um, the economy is a challenge, um, but also actually, you know, when we look at that, it's being able to respond to our clients' needs and be helpful to them um, in a world that's kind of shifted away from any kind of certainty, um, I think, you know the the picture is moving so rapidly and the, and there really aren't any answers so um you know what i've been spending most of my time doing is making sure that um clients of ours and and people that we engage with um uh, we're providing value to them so whether that's doing round tables whether that's connecting with pe them with people i think they might find useful regardless of whether or not you know it's something that's that's revenue generating for us um i think that you know that that's been the thing that I've really sort of been trying to keep up with, and 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 actually, you know, people are stressed. I think initially everyone was in shock. Then they've been so busy dealing with the operational challenges of moving to um, this kind of virtual working world, and also dealing with what what their organisations are, are, are tasking them with. Um, and then there's that kind of longer term piece around. Okay, well, you know, depending how long this goes on for, how do we not necessarily plan for it because I think still the, the, the plans are always going to be a dynamic picture, but actually, you know, get into a, a, a kind of process of evolving with it as it goes. Um, so it's it, there's, there's, there's been a lot of that work, just, just staying very close to those people that um, we work with in the industry. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I see it through another prism as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, or another lens, sorry, um, I'm still quite involved with the SLA events team. And I know, you know, we, um, because of our fantastic um, group of volunteers, we always have a really good list of events throughout the year. And we had some really good stuff lined up this year. And we've had to completely rethink some of the things that we're doing. Um, but also we wanted to respond to that, which is which is why we, we, we put today together. And I, I know there are some other bits and pieces going on. Um, but that's that's an awful lot of work that we need to need to think about and make sure that uh, we're we're providing value um, to the information community. So there's a, there's a couple of different ways that um, that it's impacted what I'm what I'm doing day to day. 
Right. Okay. So, well, I mean, I think picking up on a couple of themes there, you know, everybody there was talking about clients, customers, users. Um, you know, if you've got perhaps one um, one tech technique that you've adopted or embraced to try and engage or keep, keep, maintain a high level of engagement with your clients or users, something specifically that perhaps the audience can take away and um, think about re recycling and reusing within their own organizations. Uh, Amy, have you got any, any examples of that that you can share? Yeah, I mean, um, I, uh, as far as like how successful they are right now, I'd say we're obviously early days, so I'm, I'm hoping that these will uh, like continue to grow in success and everything. But one of the things, other than like the usual channels, so obviously um, like Twitter and emails and the like, and one of the things that we've done at University of East London is set up, is use um, Teams. Um, so obviously I know a lot of um, different institutions are using Teams now, so you've seen the adverts, like they're really, really chuffed with themselves, Microsoft right now. But um, we've set up a site specifically for that engagement between the library service and the students but not from necessarily the focus on the inquiry side of it the inquiry management um, although that is an aspect which kind of comes through it but really we were thinking that one of the things that you lose from losing an in-person um, and face-to-face -face library service is that um, like relationship and kind of the social connection and which is so important in so many um, different library settings but particularly academic libraries um, and so we were that was something that we were really worried about in, in the kind of run up to are we going to shut down because actually that's um, like a key way that people cope with their um, really difficult situations and particularly at, U, at UEL um, they've got some great relationships with the students and the frontline staff um, so I was kind of more kind of aware of it than um, maybe if I might have been in a different library setting, I'm not sure. So what we've done is set that up and that's got things like it's got different channels for like coffee mornings with your librarian, but also like I post daily um, like nice things. So, for example, uh, last week I posted about um, you can do free tours of the um, of the Vatican online now and you can do free tours of the Louvre and all the stuff that I've been wanting to do for years I like I've not done in ages because I've not traveled actually it's all coming on free online and um, so sharing a lot of stuff like that like mental health and um, well-being um, tools so it's that kind of nice yes it's about the library service of course we're always like underlying being like please look at our e-resources but it's also that actually we know that the library is so much more than that. Um, so if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about that, um, drop me a message um, and we can have a chat about it, certainly. Um, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest things we've been doing, alongside obviously using the liaison team, the academic engagement team have been absolutely vital to making that, um, like just so using those current relationships that we already have. Okay, and and I guess the question there for you is, uh, you know, around the students. I mean, clearly, um, you know, they're well, certainly much younger than I am, and uh, so are you feeling that they're embracing that technology and that platform as a as a, a learning platform, as it were, that online working in in, in, a, in an online environment. Uh, you know, certainly they're very familiar with doing this in a social setting, but uh, do you find the adoption is is high, or or has it been hesitant? What's your experience of that? Um, I think it's a real mix. So at UEL, we have our student base is a um, real mix of ages of people coming back for so um, for like vocational courses and um, for courses that they're coming back to later in life as well. Um, so our student body means that we don't it's not like we're mostly undergrad and fresh out of school. Um, so because of that, we've had more barriers, I think, to like just helping people through with some of the basic IT stuff. So I think that's something that we're trying to overcome. I, I think there's an assumption that, um, especially with things like Teams, that are like yeah, younger users will be much more comfortable. When actually, it's for for a lot of like um, in my experience with with a lot of these users, it's just another really scary big thing. It's not like WhatsApp, where it's quite intuitive. Actually, Teams is not as intuitive because it's it's like it's a great tool, and I'm loving using it. But also, there's a lot of things where you go, why is that called a stream and a channel and a what what it doesn't always make sense so you know i think it's a really easy thing to fall into is to go oh they'll be like they'll be fine when actually you start looking into the um, engagement data and they're engaging much le much less than we would know like um, and i think that a lot of that is kind of a fear and like i'm not really um, knowing all of the tools as much as we assume that they will 
Right. Okay. No, thank you for that. How about you, Simon? I mean, uh, what what techniques have you um, used to kind of stay in touch with your client base? Have you uh, got got some some tips for the for the audience? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, th I think it it kind of come touches on that point that I think Amy was hitting on about community. Um, and I think that you know we don't realise all the communities we're involved in when we're going about our, our sort of pre-COVID normal lives. Um, but actually, you know, as humans, we need it. Um, so I, I think what's been really helpful for our clients is bringing them together. We're running you know weekly roundtables on various different topics with different um, different sets of clients and and really just kind of sharing, you know, both the technical, but also the human issues people are going through, even things like, you know, some people had made hires before um, before lockdown, and then they had to virtually onboard people they'd never planned to virtually onboard, who might not have lots of experience of working virtually. So, you know, things like sharing tips on, on the human aspects of anticipating um, people's needs, um, right through to, you know, something we did yesterday, where we were looking at more sort of in the knowledge management space, but actually it was quite interesting hearing that everyone is dealing with that same issue where particularly in, in, in sort of highly governanced organizations that have suddenly implemented Slack or Microsoft Teams, or they might have always had it, but there's been an, a big uptick in use. Actually, there are a lot of sort of information governance hygiene issues there in terms of making sure that only best practice is shared or, or, or you know, um, they're compliant with um, any privacy or confidentiality around what's shared internally and where it goes. Um, but also, you know, knowledge teams, information teams, they, they need to be the enablers. They don't want to be saying, oh, don't do this and, and, and don't do that. Um, I think, um, you know, people want to um, help their organisations succeed and help them engage with and, and, and use these tools. Um, but certainly from my perspective, um, what I found most powerful is, is really connecting with clients. But um, I, I think you also can't under underestimate the power of picking up the phone and calling people. And, and certainly I know for some of my suppliers, for instance, it's been really, really hard um, in the markets that they serve. Um, and I think it's good to always remember um, those people who you've worked with and have, have supported you um, and you know I've been spending a, a, a bit of time every day just just calling people whether they're clients or um, you know people that I know that have perhaps been out of work and and, and this this situation has landed at, at this time which is very unfortunate and there's, there's obviously a slightly damp or significantly dampened job market it's it's important to remember those people and, and get in touch and, and just pick up the phone if you can. Do you have a, I mean, you touched on a couple of points there about onboarding and recruitment and the job market itself. I mean, can you give us a feel for what, you know, how how the job market for information professionals is standing up to this right now? Are you still seeing people coming to you with fresh briefs for recruitment or is it has it materially quietened down and, uh, uh, and, and is it somewhat depressed right now? Um, I'd, I'd say it's it, it's a really mixed bag, and I, I I think it's it's very much led by how organisations were set up before this, um, which which is encouraging in some some respects because um, those organisations that were already working a lot virtually and had a lot of the technology set up, etc. Um, you know, I, I think people have been through a real shock to the system when suddenly they've all had to rely on the VPN at once, etc. But actually, a lot of those organisations that are already set up for that, um, yes, there, there, there still are some opportunities ongoing. Um, I think those organisations where it was an enormous shift getting everyone to working from home, they're still just sort of finishing dealing with those operational challenges. You know, they have the shock, then they have the operational challenge of, of, of managing that transition. Um, and then now I think we're going to start to look more at the strategic questions behind it. I think obviously there's a, an economic question there. Um, you know, certain markets, um, you know, will retool their, 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 their teams to, to, you know, um, serve the opportunities that are there. So law firms will adjust slightly what they do or consulting firms can adjust slightly um, what, what types of opportunities they're going after. So, um, there still are some opportunities there, um, but yeah, it, it is a challenging job market, um, and and I think that it's important for people, um, you know, not not to sort of uh, 
assume that, that, that there's nothing out there I think the internal dialogue that you have with yourself is actually quite important it's really important to make sure you're connecting with people now is the time to um, you know get on LinkedIn see see what um, you know your old ex-colleagues are up to get in touch with people take the time to to build new skills there's there's really fantastic resources out there I know Silip have been doing a lot of online learning but also um, I know a lot of our clients even in normal times are, are starting to use things like LinkedIn Learning and Coursera and I know a lot of these kinds of platforms are, are, are doing um, are doing special deals for people so uh, I, I think you know there, there are things to be done but absolutely it's a challenging job market um, but um, you know I, I suspect we, it will be a, become a lot more clear in the next sort of two to three weeks where that's going as people finish dealing with at least the initial hurdles around that operational challenge of moving to a virtual working environment. Right. Okay. No, that's great. And, and Seema, finally for you, and again, again, the uh, you know how you staying in touch with your clients. And I'm I'm just interested because are you seeing you're in a very different situation. So are you seeing client demands changing and. Has there been a lot of uh, focus on the current crisis and, and people turning to you and your colleagues to help support them with, you know, finding out the facts about the pandemic and, and exactly what's going on? I mean, ha have you got any reflections for us on that? Well, um, well, we we always had like a digital presence, so we have people sending through queries, through question points, uh, webinars, um, and sort of like we, we've used things like Skype and telephone conversations for advice clinics in the past but those are the type of things we have to rely on now so all the techno technological bits that we were able to do beforehand we've had to carry on so um there's there's half and half of finding the service to our users because i think a lot of what we do is actually face to face in the reading room so um the main thing was switching communications wise so saying that you know um saying things are available but they're a bit differently um via via um same our events page but it might not be a physical event it would be like a zoom or go to webinar we still get a lot of inquiries coming through by email um using um question points which is which is owned by oclc i think um, and, and people presume we have access to our resources but and databases, and we have hundreds at the British Library, but our, our terms and conditions don't give us access on our home PCs, and also we can't give access to anyone across the UK. It's always been an issue with us at the British Library because we're, we're UK-wide, sometimes it can be international if a reader has an international pass. So we've always encouraged people to come into the reading room. So. Um, communicating those um, changes to people who are asking us for access and we're saying um, unfortunately we as staff don't even have access because the contracts don't give us access on our home PCs and we're working on some of those things yes we have access to some things now but we can only give that on special occasions or use it for our own sort of research but um, what we've switched to communicate with our customers is actually offering them webinars or research answering research queries or anything that comes through but saying to them there is the whole web you know web resources that are freely available that you know I, I myself have actually said the whole thing about communication 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 so telling them to you know to, to, to communicate with us but also um, looking at social media there's lots of free free um, internet sources out there um, there's one actually one good research I mentioned to to the panel just before we started the British Library had a whole research case on research resources that are available on COVID, encouraging people to actually do research on that. So making those resources, which traditionally might not have been free, but making sure they're free and they're available on web resources. That's one of the main ways of actually communicating. But for me, I'm quite conscious of people who come into the reading room, go and borrow a book and sit down, or who come into the reading room, who, who actually don't have home PCs. So I don't know what's happening with those people. In those you know those communities communities around the British Library who physically come in, but in terms of our, the people who use us online, um, I think we we are catching those. It's the ones in the physical space we aren't. Right. Oh, great. Thank you. So we're getting a lot That's of questions. Thing. I think. Um, great. Thank you, Seema. Um, I think we're getting a lot of questions about uh, well-being. Um, and so we're going to go a little bit off track from the, the questions we discussed earlier, 
perhaps to get some more de detailed reflections uh, that you've got really about the well-being, uh, you know, of the people around you, not just your your colleagues, but perhaps also other members of staff of your organisations, and, and how to look out for their well-being. Um, in, in you know what are very very difficult times, people working in unusual circumstances, often at home, cooped up. Um, you know, perhaps not with very good digital connections or you know um, uh, capability to work online. So, uh, kind of going around the room again, Simon, any any thoughts, any feedback, anything you've heard in terms of the techniques for looking after the well-being, encouraging people to be kind to themselves. Um. I, I, I think the f one of the first things to do is really set the right tone that um, you know we you can't assume anything about people's circumstances and it, this is impacting everyone in a unique way so um, you know whether or not they've got care responsibilities or um, looking after children or anything else or there may be certain aspects of their health that, that are impacted by this um you know i mean there, there's there's any one of you know a huge number of situations that could be impacting people um we did do a um a, a network meeting with with various different um senior clients that looked at an aspect of this um with regard to virtual onboarding that i mentioned um and i think you know some of the comments really ring true for well-being across the board so um you know it, it takes the whole team to onboard someone um and actually i think you know it's really important to remember that managers can't do it all on their own so i think everyone has to be involved in engaging with people understanding their colleagues situations um i think it's useful to try and assign buddies to people i think having some regular structured format of, of contact between people so that you know because I, I i i certainly know that a lot of the weeks kind of merge into one and you you need that structure and and, and people to engage with and people keeping um tabs on each other um and i think also getting to grips with the uniqueness of everyone's situation so you can anticipate that a bit. I think it was really interesting talking to our clients, some of whom had staff that were on the continent and in other places um, where, you know, in, in, in some cases the lockdown had been a lot more severe and for, and for longer and people are in, in flats and, and unable to, to move around or, um, or whatever it is. So understanding what their situation might be and anticipating what some of their needs um, are, um, and I, I think more importantly than ever, just just being kind and understanding. You know, I think um, everyone's going to struggle with this. No one's used to it, um, and uh, yeah, it's just taking that time to treat people as humans and and um, you know allow for them to have the dog interrupt them on the phone or um, you know it was. Uh, actually cheered us all up the other day when uh, I was talking to one of my suppliers and her son was dressed in his dinosaur outfit and came and jumped on her lap while we're all in a video conference and that, that was fantastic but you know you, you have to be you know we're, we're lucky her boss um, you know you have to be understanding of that um, and actually sometimes those are the things that can really cheer everyone up. Great. Okay, thank you. Seema, any, any tips from your side there around looking after people and making sure that they're, they're, yeah. they're feeling comfortable with, with their situation and helping them cope? Yeah, so um, well-being and men mental illness and um, duty of care are some of the issues that really came to front with, with, with actually going into lockdown. Um, Obviously, there's people who are who are who actually live on their own and team members who are on their own and being aware of that as well and how they're coping with the different changes. That that's one of the things that um, you, we we need to think about. Um, part of the Living Knowledge Network, um, which is part of a British Library project for um, libraries across the UK, one of the first things they did in the first week is actually run a webinar on working remotely. And one of the main themes of those webinars was actually mindfulness and actually being aware of well-being um, uh, and, and this and actually being aware of, of having a routine, as Simon was saying, and being aware of the, the, the people presume that home working is all nice and straightforward, but it can be chaotic at times because you've got a whole family around you or you might have um you know you might have the right equipment you might have 
right, right, right set in. So it's not perfect. So being conscious of that and making sure we do use our time for exercise and going out and um, taking those those allowances that we are allowed to do, because just being inside can be quite stressful. And also being on, on your own or isolating on your own to be on your own. Um, and also we are we have moved we have moved online a lot. So being being conscious of actually moving away from the computers or digital devices as well is one of the things that we should think about and making sure that people are aware of, of actually having time to to, to, to to build in items of mindfulness and well-being into their, their daily routines. I think we're all grown up, but but in terms of like suggesting that and talking about it, we've actually been doing that as a team at the British Library and, 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 and supporting each other there. And I must admit the Living Knowledge Network webinars are really good for that. Great. Okay. Thank you, Seema. That's great. Uh, uh, and Amy, again, anything from your side? I mean, I think you talked a little bit about kind of almost like a virtual coffee morning and almost doing some social stuff as well. Can you reflect on on what's working for you there in terms of looking out, out for people? Yeah, I think the having that human contact is really, really important. So we're having like more regular uh, meetings and one-to-ones and catch-ups, coffee mornings, as I've said. Um, but also, I mean, one of the big focuses that um, I've had and the rest of the management team at UEL have had is um, focusing on flexibility. So I wrote a, along with the other, um, the manager of the other library, um, a document on kind of like best practice for working from home. And it wasn't, you know, sign on at this time. It was quite the opposite. It's about saying, actually, you're not going to get your nine hours done every day, like all your seven hours, sorry, every day done anymore. You, it's just not feasible for so many people, you know. Um, we have people with situations where they just don't have anywhere that they can have a meeting and talk. Um, you've got kids around, you're homeschooling, you're trying to go shopping. When's the best um, like time to do that? And um, apart from anything else, our mental health is so up and down and dependent on day to day. I mean, I don't know if people are finding, oh, I've found this week much harder, I think, because of the weather. And um, I think it's just gotten to that point where it's been that long. I'm like, days are blurring into each other. So actually accepting that some afternoons, you might just have to give yourself the afternoon or something. Some days you might work really well in the morning and not the afternoon, or you might work much later and start later. So rather than having all of these really strict hours, which honestly, as a library, we had before, we were very much um, kind of strict nine to five, and which is not something I've worked in for a long time. So it's kind of adjusting anyway. It's kind of pulling that back and going, right, what's the human element? Presenteeism is not helpful right now for anyone. We're just all trying to do the best that we can do in a ridiculous situation. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, okay, uh, I, I guess um, sort of moving moving the conversation on. I mean, uh, Simon, you talked a little bit about suppliers uh, and how they're um, responding, and I didn't know, uh, Simon, if you want to just sort of pick up on that point around the suppliers and and how they're 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 actually responding to this situation, and, and whether you've noticed any change in their behaviour. Um. Yes, well, I mean, so it, it, certainly in, in our sector, I mean, we're a recruitment business, so we, we're predominantly served by by firms that that work in that that sector, which is obviously pretty pretty hardly hit across the board. And um, actually, interestingly, we've had a lot more understanding from some of the some of the sort of smaller firms that um, are, are more sort of specific to this industry than than we have from from larger firms that maybe feel that um you know they don't want to give any any flexibility um on on supply contracts and and things like that um i think it, it was quite interesting so we have had a chat with some of our customers um in the research market um about how their um, suppliers are reacting and, and i think for this conversation that's probably the most relevant piece and um i think what came out of that was that um Buyers really want to be treated, um, you know, as, as uh, um, fairly as possible. I don't think that anyone's out there looking for, for necessarily a, a massively, um, a, a massively discounted service unless they're in particularly hard hit industries. But I think um, now more than ever, I think suppliers really need to uh, respond with fairness. Um, and I think on the whole, it actually sounds similar that some of the larger providers are, are kind of sticking to their guns 
um, when it comes to things like pricing, which is which is fair enough. Um, but uh, but smaller ones are potentially being a little bit more flexible. I think um, when it comes to sales behaviour, um, I think really those organisations that take the time to understand their clients and anticipate their needs a little bit um, seem to be the ones that are building far better relationships. Um, and uh, I, I think um, you know people are just overwhelmed with information overload a bit. So it comes back to that sales behaviour and understanding the client enough to to make sure that they're seeing what's relevant um, and not getting absolutely bombarded um, seems to have, have shone through. Um, and there's another point about um, those providers that have been able to uh, open the curtain a little bit and, and um, let clients collaborate a bit on whether it be product development or um, you know speaking to analysts or um, you know people who are behind some of the content that are buying um, that's that's brought a lot of loyalty because because ultimately particularly in the business research space where I'm very busy most of the time if you were buying forecast information or information on um, the business climate in in most sectors I would say um, most of that you know, before a month or two ago is now out of date. So everyone's rushing to update information sources and actually um, those providers that can open the curtain a little bit into the product workflow um, and, and let um, customers feed into that seem to be the ones that are forging better relationships. And, and that's some of the things that have come out from discussions that we've had. Great. And do you think that that, that there's an increased drive maybe to more digital transformation for organizations as well as a result of this, you know, the, 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 the portability and the need to be, you know, less tied to a base is, is going to be a big driving factor and going forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think at the end of the day, everyone's aware that um, it may be some time before everyone is back in the office all the time. So yes, I think everyone is, is getting to grips with the, digital tools that are out there um, and also trying to find you know with every opportunity with every change there's always opportunity so um, yeah a a absolutely I think there's a there's a big push towards that that kind of um, you know digital transformation that's that's been talked about for so long um, but actually you know there are plenty of organizations out there that have been working like this for a very long time and and doing it very successfully I think um, the difficulty that some have had is really just dealing with the speed that they've had to do it um, and the cultural changes that go with that. Um, I think one of the big challenges for organisations will be how they um, continue to onboard staff that haven't necessarily got um, experience from other organisations. So if, if you're just entering the job market, I think it's going to be much, much harder to work entirely remotely than if you've you know spent some time in an office and absorbed the inner workings of how organizations work and things like that so i think that's going to be a, an ongoing issue for the the industry to address and um you know hopefully come together on and, and provide support to people great thank you very much so we've got around about 10 minutes left and i do want to make sure that we end this session on time um, and we've had again quite a lot of feedback um, through the chat and through padlet around um, you know what does the new normal look like do we think that some of these changes that, and these these operating if you like parameters that we now have will be continued past lockdown uh, and will we see businesses embrace more virtual working uh, and also some asks around well, what 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 are the greatest opportunities for us as a result of this uh, of this pandemic i was going to say crisis i mean it's a crisis for some but i think crisis also equals opportunity for others so um Seema, i don't know if you can you know give us a, a you know, your thoughts really on, on you know, the new normal and what opportunities are you taking away from the situation? Mm, Seema may be on mute. I think Seema's, um, so her microphone icon has switched off. Seema, it might be worth having a look at your account. 
Okay. In that case, uh, we'll, we'll jump to you, Amy, if you've got any thoughts really around new normal and, and you know, the opportunity, you're sitting there thinking, okay, how can, I, how can I make something of this? How can I take positives from it? What, what good can, can come of the situation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always um, really worth doing that anyway. I always think there's opportunities in crises and um, like I'm the kind of person I think I work, uh, like when crises come up, I'm always like, right, how can I learn from this? So what can we change? So um, I think, yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things I hope that we do is is we maintain a lot of this digital environment stuff that we've started and that forcing people in to gain that certain level of digital skill, which I think is like it's such a hard thing to learn. And we keep talking about how important it is. I'm sure um, every organization says it, but actually then getting people engaged in that and um, taking the time to say, actually, you know, we really have to use SharePoint over having a shared drive on a computer and things like that. Like, um, I hope that that momentum continues because the in-person is really, really important. And I'm not saying, um, it's not and that we should lose any of that but also we have a huge body of different users and different requirements for our service and some people um, simply cannot get in person to see a service or actually we need to be more flexible I think in what we're offering and be able to offer that kind of dual service all the time and um, so yeah I think like my hope is that we'll take that like use the fact that we've been forced into this kind of being more digitally savvy and find a way to blend the two um, so that we can create something that suits much more people. Sorry, trying to take myself off mute. Great. No, thank you very much indeed, Amy. So, uh, so ending on a positive note, Simon. What's what's the positives? What's the upside? <laughs> um uh, I'll, I'll be an optimist so um i think for a start there, there, there is no new, new normal yet because this is not normal at all um but i think um moving forward um where are the opportunities for knowledge management or information professionals or librarians um in some respects you know this 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 crisis um uh, as it is for some as you say um, I think it really brings those skill sets to the fore. You know, if you're in a knowledge intensive industry and you've kind of got by with a few shared folders because you've had, you know, as Amy said, presenteeism or you've had, um, you know, uh, 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 an office where everyone can collaborate in a certain way, I think actually now business is more than ever, you know, whether it be through, um, you know just the need to collaborate online but also you know if, if people are unavailable because of situations like this um, or you can't access certain people you know that actually the management of your knowledge assets um, are so important but e equally um, I think the other thing that's been really been brought to the fore is um, in such a fast-moving situation the integrity of and, and, and quality checking behind the information that you're acting on has never been so important. Um, I had a conversation the other day with a client who said that by the time something's written, it's probably out of date at the moment. So they're really kind of having to collaborate between different organisations and that management of the information flow um, is, is a you know, huge job in itself. So um, I think that skill set that the information professional brings, whilst you know, obviously we're going to be at, uh, going to be within a, an economically subdued situation. I think actually, um, as organisations reflect on this, I think business continuity is going to be a massive topic for decades to come after this. And I think a core part of that process needs to be um, a, a knowledge and information management um, question. Um, I think that needs to be addressed in, in so many organisations that perhaps never thought that they needed that that type of culture or um, never realised it was a problem until, um, you know, that Thursday evening when Boris um, said, you know, it'd be better if you work from home. I mean, I know of some that sort of from the next day were working from home and that was at five o'clock. So um, I think it will change the world a little bit and these skills will be really important, particularly as people start to you know, look at their Slack environments and teams and things like that and realise how many documents are maybe in the wrong place or, or shouldn't be shared. Um, and as I say, I don't think it's a time for the information profession to go around and um, tell everyone what they can't do. 
um, I think it's the time for them to be enablers and, and I think they're well placed to do that. Great, thank you. That's and hopefully enough. we've got, <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, oh, that was great. That was great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm elated with that. Um, so uh, hopefully Seema's managed to reconnect. So Seema, uh, what, what, what's the positives you're taking out of this whole experience? You know, what's the, the, the key opportunity for you going forward? Um, having a look, I don't think she has managed it, which um, no. I mean, real life, knowing the joys of working online, isn't it? Unless that was that theme I heard. Tina? No, I don't think it was. Sorry. Maybe one of the key opportunities is to improve technology and make it so much more reliable for us to be able to connect and work on this basis moving forward. And I speak as as, as one guilty of that because you probably can't see me right now. So uh, I've had challenges to this evening. So uh, maybe that's uh, something to think about. Okay, look, um, I'm really, really sorry we can't catch Seema's last uh, closing thoughts on that. I do apologize to you, Seema. Um, but we do need to wrap up now. Um, I'm shortly going to hand back to Amy. Uh, she's got a couple of closing remarks and a couple of uh, announcements to make. Uh, but I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to the panel uh, and also to everybody online as well. Thank you for the questions coming through. Um, I've tried my best to incorporate them into the conversation rather than make them too overt. But and hopefully that's uh, that's worked for you and you've got something from that. I am sure sure that our panelists would um, welcome the opportunity to speak to you one-to-one -one if you've got specific questions or anything arising out of the conversation tonight that you would uh, you'd like to, to, to drill down on or get further information on um, but uh, I, at this point I am going to sign off and hand back to Amy and say thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen, um, and for everyone else on the panel, um, and for all of you at home who's joined us into your evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. This is the response has been overwhelming, and I think um, it kind of shows how much there is a need to connect with each other and know that we're all um, we are all in this like going through the same thing, and yet yeah, we're not you know in exactly the same situation, um, but really that we're all here to support each other and want to share. Um, so there was a lot of questions. Um, hello, Asima, you're back. <laughs> Um, so there was a lot of questions on um, coming through on the Padlet and on the questions um, on GoToWebinar as well. So I've answered a couple of them. Hi, yeah, um, sorry. What, that's all right. Um, just in closing statements. Um, so what I think might be a good idea, just because of how many we've had, I mean, I've had loads of them picking up every time you guys have added something to the Padlet, um, is we were thinking of doing a blog post after this anyway um so number one if there is anyone interested in writing a blog for, for us or um kind of giving a rundown of what they got from this webinar please do contact us because we'll pop you on our website um, and we'd really appreciate that but i think there's also maybe um an argument for us to do a follow-up um which answers some of those questions it might be compiling some of them but there's been so many coming through i'd really um, think it's a good idea maybe for us to to work together as a panel and um, seema and simon if you agree to get a response to some of those because like we really appreciate you guys engaging um so much and we know actually an hour is, is never long enough so are you guys on board for that all right Sign Absolutely, up. and I, I think actually it might lead us to, to other ideas for things that we can do to, to support people. So, um, and I think you know that that's the thing I always say. You know, SLA is a very flexible platform um, as as an organisation. Um, it's always worth putting your hand up and getting involved, and there's always loads of volunteering op opportunities. And um, you know, ultimately, it is what you make it as as members. So, um, it's always worth getting involved and and um sending that initial email yeah we'd really love to hear from you what i will say is the padlet is open at the moment appreciate you guys might have a bit to mull on what i'll do is i'll leave it open for tonight so you have the link and um, i'll tweet out the link as well and just as a follow-up on the reply to one of um our advertisements for this webinar and um, feel free to continue adding tonight and then i'll close it and like i said we'll, over the next week or two we'll have a look at that and answer and um, so last thing before you all head off and eat your dinners um, I just want to tell you guys about some of our upcoming um, webinars and events that we've got. Um, so we have a really exciting one um, on the 27th of May. Now this is just for SLA Europe members. Um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about membership, please do contact us and we'll tell you all the wonderful things um, and try not to make it too sales pitchy. Um, but this is one of the, the benefits. Occasionally we have some really special speakers um, coming that are able to do um, member-only webinars. So this one is done by Tracy, who is Information Security Analyst 
it's New York Times company. Um, and this is a day in the life of your information security. So she's um, going to be talking about tips from an information security professional on how to best understand and navigate through what can be a really scary and confusing practice of trying to keep your information safe. She's really good. I've spoken to her on many occasions and she kind of blows me away. She's such a, um, an interesting speaker. So I'd encourage people to join that. Um, and then at the end of the end of June, we have um, another event coming up. No dates confirmed yet, but we'll get that out as soon as we can, um, which is what is solid and what does it mean um, to me as an information professional? So we'll have um, Tim talking to us about that. So, again, some really exciting stuff coming up, plus some blog posts coming your way. But if you're interested in writing for us, in joining us, in learning anything more, let us know. And don't forget, our contact details are on our website. So you can always contact us individually if you have follow up specifically about say teams or i know there was a specific question for simon and seema so um feel free to send them directly if you want an earlier response okay um so with that i'll say thank you very much and um enjoy your evening thank you again to stephen simon uh simon and seema um i've had a really lovely night so thank you i hope you all have a good week and stay safe thank you good night thanks very much thank bye you. now bye